as I mentioned last night, John explains some of the main purpose in his book in 1 John 5.13, which he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And uh, I mentioned last week that maybe kind of uh, if we have a title for the series, maybe we would call this uh, study of 1 John true life. Um, emphasis on true, especially tonight. Um, true life. Because there's a false life. And we started talking a little bit about some of the um, first century uh, um, thoughts that were going on that were... Um, threatening the good doctrine of the church around the person of Jesus, namely that there were some people who were believing that, that you couldn't have a son of God who was also flesh. You couldn't have Jesus the Christ and also Jesus the man because that doesn't reconcile with some kind of early Gnostic thoughts. And this idea that, hey, if all that really matters is what's spiritual and like some spiritual enlightenment and knowledge, then what we do doesn't necessarily matter. Um, if you want fellowship with God, just be enlightened and don't worry about sin or whatever we're doing in the flesh. That's just not important. And so there was kind of these two things, this misevaluation of who Jesus is, his full identity, and the misevaluation of the life that he calls us to. And we said if you reduce Jesus and you don't recognize him for all that he is, you reduce his commands. And um, so they were teaching a sort of false life, I would say. Well, I hope that we uh, don't want false life, but we want true life, which is found in Jesus. And um, so our passage tonight uh, starts, uh, we're starting in verse 5, um, talking about, uh, John has been talking about this, this person, this word of life, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, um, who, who spoke a message. And John says what that message is in verse 5. I thought so. Hey! Oh, <laughs> Kobe Bryant's on the night. <laughs> nice. Um, Jake, you can grab one of those folding chairs when you need. Um, so verse 5 says this. This is the message that we have heard from him. I believe that's talking about, about Christ. And proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. It is the message, the message that he heard from, from Jesus. God is light and in him, in God there's no darkness at all. Now, light and darkness, like within Christianity, like scripture, and even other religions, um, a lot of different religions or philosophy, like there's some common thoughts about light and darkness that we even kind of innately know and understand. And I think first century hearers of this would also kind of recognize and know and understand. I think it could be summarized. Some of the, some of the uh, um, metaphorical use of light and dark would be this. There's a commentator, John Stott, that kind of uh, summarized it this way. He said, intellectually, light is truth and darkness is ignorance or error. So it, anytime, especially if you speak in scripture specifically, light is generally associated with truth and darkness with falsehood, intellectually. Then he says, morally, light is purity and darkness is evil. Okay, so you see the, the kind of difference between those two, but they're both throughout scripture. Yeah, light is, is trueness and falseness, but light is also good and and evil, like it, it talks about, or, or that metaphor is used kind of in, in both of those ways, it seems. And um, just to continue quoting this commentator, he says, the effect of light is not just to make people see, that's the intellectual thing, what they can see, but to enable them to walk. So right conduct, he says, is not just clear vision, it's the benefit which light bestows. So if you hold out a lamp, not only can you see what's in front of you, but you're enabled now to walk in what's in front of you. So that's kind of those two components. It shows the truth about what's out ahead, or the truth in general, and then it, it, it calls you to live in light 
no pun intended, in light of that, or it, it enables you to live in that truth, and there's a, a goodness in walking in that light. And, um, and, and like I said, this isn't like, you all, we know this kind of um, innately, like what light does, and what, what darkness does, and kind of the significance of that, both physically, like just light and darkness, and then also metaphorically. Um, like if you're at your parents' house as a high schooler in the den, with the lights out, with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're making out. You know what kind of goes down in that situation. And then somebody randomly flips on the light, and um, like we know, well, physically we can picture what happened. The light comes on, you can see everything, but also there's some like darkness maybe that's dispersed, or all, all of a sudden there's um, when something's brought to the light, maybe darkness doesn't go down. And that darkness being like the maybe evil that, that could have gone down. Or like we say stuff like, hey, I want to bring something to the light. Like we might use that terminology. And that just means, hey, I want to. I want to explain the truth of this, right? That's kind of that intellectual side where we say, hey, this person is, is really living in darkness. Well, we know that's, um, that's kind of that moral side of it in, in evil or whatever. So we kind of, we, we understand this. And, and just based on, on kind of our, our understanding that I think first century hearers, again, would understand, to hear the statement God is light and in him is no darkness at all, we could probably infer, and I want to go beyond inference here, but that God is is truth, means of truth, and that God is morally pure or good. That might be a, I think that's a fair safe assumption, and I think that what we see here today and throughout the rest of scripture, that's, I think, yeah, God, Jesus is the truth and uh, certainly morally pure and good. Um, but, so let's look at verse 6 here. If we say we have fellowship with him, I put these down on the board actually because it gets a little bit, um, a little bit repetitive and I want to draw some kind of parallels between what's being said. So if you want to refer up there, you can. Um, but verse 6 is, if we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, it sounds like maybe there was some in John's day claiming to have some sort of fellowship with God while still walking in darkness. And maybe that goes along with what I was saying where righteousness doesn't really matter if, I, if I'm spiritually or if my knowledge is enlightened enough, I can have fellowship with God. But John's saying, no, if you say you have fellowship with God but you're walking in darkness, um, you're, that's that's all. There's deceit in that. You're not practicing the truth. Um, the question that kind of comes to my mind when I read that is, well, what is walking in darkness? Like, what exactly is that? Can we? I don't want to. We don't want to just say, well, it's darkness tends to just be evil. So maybe, um, maybe we have a vague understanding of it. What is walking in darkness? Um, maybe the the easiest answer that kind of comes to our mind is, well, it's sinning. Walking in darkness is doing things that we're not supposed to do, right? Like that's uh, the answer that just kind of first comes to my mind. What is walking in darkness? And we said, hey, the moral equivalent of darkness is evil. So if you're if you're walking, maybe what John is saying is, if you're walking in darkness, if you're if you're sinning, if you're doing evil, then maybe that is um, is disrupting your your fellowship with God, um, because God is light. And in him there is no darkness. So if you're living in darkness, then that doesn't sync with fellowship with him. Um, so maybe there were these, these um, her heretical thinking people that were deceived into thinking somehow they could have this fellowship with God while they still practiced sin. And um, a, another commentator says they were deceived into thinking this and they were deceived into thinking that the experience which they thought was fellowship with God really wasn't fellowship with him. So there's like two kinds of deception. They're like, well, first of all, if we can have fellowship and our, our righteousness doesn't matter so much, but they were also deceived and, well, they thought they were having fellowship, but they weren't really having fellowship. Um, and I think Paul would say, you, this isn't exactly the point of the passage in 2 Corinthians, but he's, he mentions what fellowship has light with darkness. 
Um, that's kind of, I, I think that's a kind of a similar idea. Well, felt if, if God is light, then how can somebody who's living in darkness or living in sin, we could say, um, have fellowship with him? Well, it, it doesn't make sense. So, I don't know about you all, but I hope to have fellowship with God. Um, and in order to do that, if we look at the next verse, it means walking in the light. So, verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We're going to talk in a little bit about fellowship with one another, but if walking in darkness, if we define walking in darkness as sin, then you might define walking in the light as not sinning, or, or doing good, to phrase it positively. Um, and again, that goes along with what we said. Well, yeah, morally, light is good and, and evil or darkness is bad. But I believe, and I'm going to tell you why, but I believe what John is talking about here, walking in darkness, isn't the equivalent of sinning. Oh, they're walking in darkness, so they're sinning. And walking in the light isn't the exact equivalent of not sinning. Okay? Um, and just... If it were, by the way, it'd be a little unhelpful of John to be like, "Hey, you want fellowship with God? Then just stop sinning. Walk in the light. Stop sinning." That's like a, that's. I mean, I've, had, I've probably said that to people, and pastors have said that before, and, and there's some good truth to that. But um, the reason that I say, if walking in darkness means sinning, and and walking in light means not sinning, here's why I think it doesn't make perfect sense. Because then you could look at verse 7 and say, if we don't sin or walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. If we, if we don't sin, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. You see how it's like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't exactly make sense. Maybe walk in the light isn't just somebody who is not sinning. Um, does that make sense what I just said? Yeah. Um, so if you go on, though, then I, the next two verses, I think, um, are some somewhat parallel verses to 6 and 7 and say some very similar things. So verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, this is a little bit of a new topic, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I want you to just look at the parallels there between verse 6 and 8, first of all. Um, if we say this, we have fellowship with him um, while we walk in the darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see how there's like some parallels going on here. Um, so we are walking in darkness when we say something that isn't true to real life. I know this is kind of like abstract, just go with me on it. So I would say, I'm beginning to see that walking in darkness is not just sinning, but it's sinning and lying about it, or saying that the sin doesn't exist, or hiding the sin, which is what darkness is good for, right? You hide things in darkness. And then if walking in darkness is sinning and hiding it, then what might walking in the light be? I don't think it means just completely not sinning, because that, that can't really happen. But look at the parallel here. If we walk in the light, it goes on to talk about a sort of cleansing. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I see a really close parallel, and I think one of the things that John may be doing in this is saying, hey, he, he's further describing some of what's going on in 6 and 7 with 8 and 9, and I think there's a really close connection with walking in the light and confessing our sins. Um, so l let me just go on from there. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Again, this is very similar to, I kind of tried to color code it a little bit with verse eight here, right? You see all this, if we say we have no sin, if we say we've not sinned, again, there's some sort of deception, lying, truth, God's word, there's just all this kind of parallel 
doesn't go. But there's just one thing to point out. There's, there is a difference in these things. When, when John says, if we say we have no sin, that word sin in the Greek is um, singular. Um, and, and so it's, it's a concept of sin. This word sin in verse 10 is a plural. And there's a, a little bit of a, a nuance of a difference in there, a difference between having sin or have no sin and having not sinned. Um, that sin, I believe, is what a, a lot of scripture talks about, the sin that is in our nature. It's not necessarily addressing a, a particular sin. Particular sins are an outworking of some of the nature of sin that we're born into. And the plural sin is maybe, yeah, talking about particular sins that we've committed. So just to, there's, there's some of both of those going on. But both of those things, it seems, should be admitted or confessed. And if we don't do that, if we say that it doesn't exist in us, and if we haven't had sins, then we deceive ourselves. And uh, not only that, you're not only deceiving yourself, but you're calling God a liar. Um, which, I don't want to do that. Um, if you look at throughout scripture, you get, I mean, you all, many of you know this, but you learn that, hey, sin is this universal problem um, for all people. Ecclesiastes says, there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And you guys maybe heard Romans 3.23, all have sinned, right? So to deny that you've sinned, you're denying what God has clearly revealed in his word, and you're calling him a liar. And it's one thing to deceive yourself but it's, and, and lie to yourself, but it's a whole new kind of bad to call God a liar. And then it says, and his word is not in us. He's made it plain to us in his word that all have sinned. So if you deny it, you don't have his word. His word is not in you. Maybe there's a little bit of a word play too. John likes to use that word word for Jesus like he did up in verse 1 or 2. Um, and in a similar way, maybe there's some sort of like connection with, with fellowship there. And then, then Jesus, you're not fellowshipping with the word if you're saying that you, that you don't have sin. Um, but I want to go back to the idea of, of fellowship. Um, John's emphasis in this passage, I believe is not just, hey, if you don't confess your sin, you're a liar. Like, that's, that's true. <laughs> um, but if you don't confess your sin, it's worse than just, oh, you're a liar, but you, it seems, are impeding your fellowship with him, with God, and with one another. And that makes it, I mean, that kind of shows the reality of sin or walking in the darkness or unconfessed sin um, that it can impede our fellowship with God. And so if you notice um, verses 6 and 7, they talk about having fellowship with God and with one another. And it's really interesting if we, in verse 6, if we walk in the darkness, we don't really, we don't have fellowship with him, it says. But if we walk in the light, we really do have fellowship. You would think it would say with him, but it's with one another. And so there's this reality coming up again. If you guys remember last week, we saw it in verse 3. That, and this is, this is tough, and I feel like uh, American Christianity. But true fellowship with God necessarily means fellowship with Believers, or with with the brothers, or with the church, and, and vice versa. You can't have true the, the deepest sense of fellowship with the church if you if you don't have fellowship in the Lord. Um, and, and I think you guys can can see if if you're walking in darkness, if you're lying to yourself, or you're lying about others about your sin then you're closed off from true fellowship with God and with those other people. So I want to give um, just a bit of an illustration. It's not a light, a light guy. I'm not going to do a light show, <laughs> though I would like to. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that really dragged the point home, you know, of this. But um, <laughs> I do, and some of y'all have, have kind of thought through things like this before, but um, light is, is a 
a penetrating power that really darkness can't stand up against, or like scripture would say in different ways, darkness can't overcome light. There's no way for it to happen. So if we have my little, there we go. Thanks, Ben. Could you hit five off too? Or four off too? There we go. So I have this little box that you, you all didn't see. And our room is pitch black right now, right? Almost. And um, I'm just going to open this box a little bit, just a bit, and you can see, oh, there's light inside the box, and the reality is the the darkness, like that, that light like gives us, I'm going to try not to shine in your eyes, but like we can, even with a tiny bit of light that this little flashlight gives off, we can like really start to see, and, and the, just a tiny bit of light and a whole lot of darkness in the room, right, is overcome just by this little bit of light. On the other hand, if we had all of our lights on, would you mind to turn those on? This, we need a battery. This is so embarrassing. <laughs> if we have our lights on, and say we have a box that's full of darkness, right? I mean, it's pitch black, but it's really pitch black inside this box. There's no light in there. And it's like, well, let's make the room darker. It's like, okay, here we go. This isn't a magic trick. <laughs> Oh, nothing happened, like it's, the room didn't just get darker because I let the darkness out, right? It's still, it's still just, it's light. Um, and, and, I mean, that says something about light in and of itself, which I think is true to the biblical, the biblical use of, kind of, it's metaphorical use. But in order to walk in darkness, or an unconfessed sin, which I think is what uh, what this passage is, is mainly talking about, you have to close yourself off from the light, because in God there's no darkness at all, and light overcomes darkness. So, like, if I want to have the darkness that, like, that is within, that was within that box, or if I want to have darkness here and walk in darkness, you literally have to cut it off from the light, right? You can't. It's only dark because there's no fellowship with the light now. Um, on the other hand, walking in the light or confessing sin is shining light into the darkness, and now it's light inside the box too, right? So, all that to say, if you crave fellowship, or if you desire fellowship, not only with God, but with one another, it will happen only when we walk in the light, and I'd say specifically, um, according to verse 9 there, that's talking about confessing our sin. Um, and the okay thing about confessing our sin is that we all have it, right? Um, if you want true true fellowship and having in common with other people, that's kind of what fellowship means, then you don't try to hide your own sin. Guess what? The other, everybody else has sin too, and so um, there's there's no need to hide it. And and some of our fellowship, ironically, comes from the fact that we we share in the same life experience. But um, and you could say you could ask the question: Hey, are we really experiencing fellowship with one another if we're lying about our our stuff and hiding our stuff? No, we're not. That's that's not true fellowship with God or with each other. And um, so I hope you kind of see what's going on here, that if you want fellowship with God and with each other, which we said last week in verse 4 kind of talks about, John says, that's, what, that's what's going to bring joy. Then walk in the light. And walking in the light doesn't mean being perfect. It means being honest about your sin and confessing it. Okay? Now, after all that said, there's two wrong directions that we can take that. The first wrong direction is we could say, well, should, can we just keep on sinning as long as we confess it, we're walking in the light, and so let's just keep, let's just keep confessing our sin, and we'll, we'll be good to go, right? Um, and so that's why John, I think one of the reasons maybe he says the next verse, which um, is chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
it's kind of like when Paul says in um, Romans 6, he's talking about grace and, well, hey, should we keep on sinning so that grace would abound? It's like, no, absolutely not. May it never be. That doesn't, that doesn't, that's not the purpose. But on the contrary, there's an element of walking in the light that leads to a cleansing in both of these things. Walking in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us, we confess our sins, and he forgives us and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. There's two like beautiful truths that are happening. I love this verse 9, maybe you memorized it, I did in like, Sunday school as a little kid. You confess your sins, he's faithful and just. There's two things it seems that's happening, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love how one, one commentator put it, it's he, to forgive us is to remove the debt that we owe, and to cleanse us is to remove the stain. And um, I don't know if you all have ever been in like accountability groups um, where you talk about your sin with each other and you confess your sin to each other, and every time that you get together every week, you just keep confessing your sin to each other and nothing ever changes. And it's like, well, we feel kind of good because at least we're confessing our sin to each other. But it's like no, there's, no, uh, there's no walking out of that. Well, that's not, that's not what the fellowship that God's talking about. That's not the purpose of, of John. That's not the purpose of confessing our sins. But true fellowship with God, we're going to see this in the coming weeks. True fellowship with God, who is light, causes us to become more like him. And we're going to see, hey, if you, if you really know God, your life is going to begin, not on our own doing, but the Spirit's doing, I believe, your life is going to begin to look like him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Um, so God is light, we read at the description of what, uh, or the beginning of our verses today. In him there's no darkness. So walk in the light, not, um, not keep on sinning. And um, maybe you've been, if you're fortunate, um, I was in one of these, an accountability group, uh, that in your confession of sin to God and even to each other, you find that your sin begins to lessen or it begins to kind of dissipate because light's been shed. And I think that that's what should happen. We should shed the light out of Maya's eyes just waking her up. Um, that's what should happen. It's not, oh, as long as I keep confessing my sin, well, then I'm, I'm good. That's what walking in the light looks like. But no, confession and righteousness seem to go hand in hand. So we let our sin be exposed, we confess it, and in doing so, it seems that God begins some process of cleansing us, and the cleansing doesn't happen without confession. Okay, so like if you take your car to a mechanic, it's like... Um, you want them to diagnose the problem, and so say they tell you, well, you need this new belt or whatever. That's all I can say about cars. Um, they have belts, right? Uh, so they say you need this new belt. Well, you have to like be willing to agree or, or conf confess that, yes, the car needs a new belt for them to actually go in and fix the problem. If you just deny it, and you're like, nope, that, you're, you're wrong, that, that belt's going to be fine. You're denying your sin. You're, you're walking in darkness. You can say, they're not going to begin to fix the problem. Like, you have to give your approval and say, yes, there is a problem. Yes, you can go ahead and do it before they're going to begin to fix it. And I think that John isn't suggesting, like, perfection of us, because perfection would be lying. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. He's not suggesting perfection, but he's suggesting confession, and it's a confession that leads to God's perfecting us over time, which we call sanctification, okay? But I'll say that again. He's not suggesting perfection, though we are called to perfection, Jesus calls us to that, but he's not suggesting that that's going to happen. We have sinned. What John's suggesting here is a, is a confession, a walking in the light that then leads to our, our growth in him, or our perfecting over time, or our sanctification. So the, the first place that I don't want us to go wrong in this is just to say, well, we just have to confess our sin, and then we're good at that, and we just keep on sinning, and no big deal. The other place, and this is where I just want to get really real and kind of end with, with these thoughts. Um, if y'all are like me, the topic of confession, confession of sin, can kind of like make the hairs on your neck stand up because it's not a pleasant thing. Like when, usually in my mind, when I think, well, I'm going to confess sin, it's not a 
not a pleasant thing to, to the Lord certainly or even to other people um, but I believe the way and we're going to look at the next two verses I believe that the way that John doesn't want us to go in talking about bringing things into the light is the direction of fear fear of exposure like oh my gosh what will happen if I'm actually honest about my sin like that's a scary thought to me and so John goes on in the next part of verse chapter 2 verse 1 if anyone does sin which he's already said we will we know we will we have I love this we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous he is the propitiation for our sins and not only for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world so John is writing he says so that you won't sin but when you do listen y'all when you do you don't have to hide because Jesus is our advocate he's our defense counsel and he's righteous so he doesn't have to defend himself but he can intercede on our behalf and, and request the forgiveness from the Father and the, the request is not made on what we've done but it's based on his blood and so when you're tempted when thinking about the topic of confession and how, how scary that might be or what that might look like don't go to fear um, this fear of the repercussion of confession because Jesus this is what John is saying Jesus is both your advocate and he's your sacrifice and there's forgiveness and cleansing when we confess our sin and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that word propitiation in verse 2 um, a little bit difficult to define kind of probably carries with it two ideas of hey God's wrath is is appeased as sin is forgiven in, in the blood of Christ or as one commentator said I, this I thought was the best definition of propitiation I've heard it is an appeasement of the wrath of God by the love of God through the gift of God it's an appeasement of the wrath of God by the love of God through the gift of God, the, the sacrifice of his son. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. I would say that's similar to walking in darkness. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. So here's what you risk in, in confession. I'm talking confession before the Lord and just in general a life of confession even before other people. And I know it's, it's not fun, but here's the risk of it. You risk some embarrassment. You risk maybe coming off as a worse person than people actually thought of you. But here's what you gain in confession forgiveness because of Jesus the righteous who is our advocate and sacrifice cleansing because it, it allows the spirit to be to begin the, that perfecting work in that area of our life forgiveness cleansing true fellowship with God and with God's people the church who by the way are just like us in need of it and Jesus might just come off as more incredible than people thought he was before because of that forgiveness and cleansing and fellowship that he provides. I would say hopefully we desire those things more than the embarrassment that we feel and we're willing to run away from that fear and let Jesus do a work and, and give us true life that he calls us into. I'll pray for us. Father, oh, you've provided so much for us. And you know our limitations. And sometimes I try to um, try to deny that and think that I'm a little bit better 
than I am, or a lot better than I am. And sometimes I think if I just don't think about it, or if it just doesn't get out of the bag, then uh, you, it, it just kind of can go away, and I can still just have just as good of a relationship with you. Um, but Lord, would you help us to be honest about who we are, and would you help us to be so... Um, I think this puts us in a place of just neediness for your forgiveness, which you freely provide, you offer to us. Um, so, um, God, would you convict us where where there's sin in our life, maybe that we've deceived ourselves so much that we don't even recognize that it's there, or, or those things maybe that you bring to our mind tonight, or those things that we know we've been burying and unwilling to address, would you, uh, would you bring those to the surface? Would you give us by your spirit of willingness to bring those into the light that we can be changed, that we can be exposed before you, because really we are, you know us, and um, and Lord, may we sense us, uh, have a sense of restored fellowship with you and with each other as we um, make a practice of confessing our sin. God, help us in the next few days, even if there's specific things that we'd like to confess to you and maybe have others walk alongside of us. And would you help us to not forget or just to try to minimize it again tomorrow? but to actually take some steps of, of true confession and repentance and um, yeah, help us in that, Lord. Amen.